powerful and uh, needed, needed reminder, right? And uh, we need to sing gospel truth into our life in, in such an uh, important way. I know probably many of you woke up yesterday, and uh, if you at all casually interested in what goes on in the world, uh, you wake up to find out that, that uh, Hamas, which is part of Palestine, had uh, launched an attack on Israel. And uh, it gets all sorts of different kind of coverage. Um, it is clearly an, an unprovoked, uh, unjust attack. And um, the Bible tells us that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, we can do that without really even fully understanding the implications from a geopolitical nature. We can we can do that without understanding and even uh, overreacting to what we would call last day events or eschatological issues. Um, it's just horrific when one nation attacks another and uh, particularly when they aim their attack at uh, civilians, innocent women and children. And uh, so we are praying for peace and we're praying for justice. We're praying for uh, the will of God to be done. I think it's important as a church that we, we remind ourselves about that. There's there's a war going on in Ukraine. There's now a war in the Middle East. And uh, we have a responsibility as uh, followers of Jesus uh, to pray for uh, and work towards what is right and just in the world around us. So let's pray together as uh, we go to study the Word of God. Uh, we want to be thinking about people that are in harm's way and going through very difficult situations around the world. Father, we come today, we do confess a, a love for Israel. They are uh, your chosen people. There is uh, something special and significant about even the city of Jerusalem, where your son was crucified for us, where he defeated death and sin forever on our behalf. And Lord, we know that there are a perpetual hatred between the Arabs and the Jews. And Lord, we know that um, anything that is unjust, anything that brings harm and hurt to people is uh, a concern to the heart of God. And Lord, we, we stand with Israel. We pray for peace. We pray for the perfect will of God to be done. And Lord, we ask that you would superintend over the affairs of men. Help us not to be troubled by what happens in the world, but have complete and total confidence in you and in your plan. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Really glad you're here today. Uh, I, in the early service, I jumped right into the uh, message in this series. I'm going to do that in this hour. If you're a guest, we'll, we'll uh, greet you afterwards and uh, we'll try our best to connect you, have, help you to have a great experience while you're here today. And uh, we're going to begin a, a new series today and it goes for the next three weeks. Actually, the next two series are kind of linked together. They're, they're, they have a, a common thread and a common theme. I was telling Tommy, he spoke in the a classic service this morning, and uh, I told him earlier that I, I didn't really spend a lot of time on any particular thought in this message. I, I really just want to do what I would call a a kind of a personal reflection or uh, share my heart about uh, the the subject of revival and why I think it's so absolutely critical, and I, and I think that's true generally, broadly in the world, but I think it's specifically true about our church here, and I think it's true about my life, and uh, I uh, believe and want, desire, covet that you would experience it as well. When we talk about revival, we're really talking about a spiritual renewal, spiritual revitalization. If I could if I could describe it in, in a simple concept, it would be this, that what you know to be true about Christianity would become experiential and real to you. 
okay? So I doubt I'm gonna say anything today. I, I, I may, and that, uh, some may be in different points of the journey. I highly doubt I'm gonna say anything today that most of you are gonna violently disagree with. But you can agree with it and still not have experience of it. In other words, it, it, it can be true without it being real. And, and my point in this series is to help the truths of Christianity to become real in your life. That's important. As a church and a ministry, we're 108 years old, and so there's a constant need to renew, to update, to, to refresh, to reform, to come back, if you will, to gospel truth. We have multiple campuses now, and, and uh, we have, we have in, in many cases, leadership that is emerging in our church, and, and there's a need to think through and, and to invite people into uh, church, wherever we're doing it here, Oak Leaf, Mandarin, in, in, a, in a healthy way into a, a grip of, if you will, of the gospel. It is easy in institutional church life, institutional Christianity, when I say institutional, I'm talking about the, the outward form of Christianity, the, you know, the going to church, the involvement, engagement, activities. It's easy for us to, to lose our grip on the gospel in a way that moralism and formalism sets in. Moralism being, hey, the better we are, the more we're accepted by God. You know, good people do good things, bad people do bad things. Or, or formalism, it, it really literally becomes the way that the form and structure, the way that we do church matters over the reality of church. I want you to be reminded that we're in a cosmic battle between the forces of good and evil. And you're, you're actually seeing that in the world today. That there's a battle between light and darkness, and there's going to be times of spiritual decline where it appears that the darkness is pushing against the light, where it appears that evil is winning against good. The kingdom of God is, is there to resist the encroachment of the darkness, and we cannot do that. You can't do that individually in your own life. You can't do that for your family. You can't experience that as a church if we're not living out of spiritual revival. Here's why this is important, okay? And it should be important to you, and it, and it is. It is important to me. Um, let me just ask you a question. I want you to think about this for a moment. How many of you have children here on campus? They may not be in this room but you have children here on campus today, right? And I would assume, I have conversations every week with people, but I would assume largely that some of you are here today because you know, hey, I gotta, if, if I want my kids to believe what I believe, right? Is that, is that a good assumption? And that you want what's happening in children's ministry or in student ministry, you, you want gospel truth to be taught to them and reinforced in them. And, and not that you're depending upon the church to do it for you, but you're depending upon the church to come alongside of you and teach Christian truth to them. And, and, and so what tends to happen oftentimes is that we think, hey, I believe this, so my kids are going to believe this. Well, it takes more than that. Trust me, it, it takes you experiencing it and your kids experience it. If you don't, what happens is you, you grow up with this, this uh, second and third generation view about Christianity. So what I'm going to do is, is today, there, there have been numbers, really untold numbers of, of spiritual movements in church history. You, the big ones, of course, are uh, the Reformation, the 1500s, Martin Luther would be the key figure in that, the, the Edwards, Whitfield, Wesley, First Great Awakening. There's the Second Great Awakening. It came about 100 years later. Uh, there was the Prayer Revival, 1857, Je Jeremiah Lamphere. There was the Welch Revival, Evan Roberts, early 1900s. Um, there's, there's been a number of different, even more local Asbury Revival, the 70s. Um, there's a recent Asbury Revival, uh, the Zusa. Pacific Revival in California, 1930s. It's just a, a number of, of experiences that, that have happened throughout church history. 
And there are some truths, some, some anchors, some elements that you find in every single uh, movement. I, I took a graduate class several years ago on the history of revivals. And, and I'm going to talk today some about what is true in every revival. This is what you have to experience in order for you to experience spiritual renewal. It's what we have to move to corporately. And if there's ever going to be a move of God, these elements are, are going to be there. We're going we're gonna to spend our time today, not, not very deep in it, but, but just enough to kind of underscore. We're going to spend our time in Colossians chapter 2. And I'd encourage you to, to look there. Richard Lovelace in his book, Dynamics of Spiritual Life, said spiritual vitality is often a neglected stepchild in Christianity. What, what, what Lovelace is driving at is simply this, is that you can, you can teach at such what I would call an academic level, or you can teach at such a, a, a doctrinal level that people know things, and yet what they know doesn't work their way into their life. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Colossae, the Colossians, one of four prison epistles, you got uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You can find Colossians at the end of those four. And he writes a very important little statement. He says in verse number six, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Let me, let me try to explain that to you really quick. This is very important to understanding kind of where we're going. The same way that you received Jesus, and, and to receive Jesus means the same way that you came to accept the truth about Jesus' life, about Jesus' death, about Jesus' resurrection, the same way you received it, you should also walk in that truth. In other words, becoming a Christian, and, and some of you can, in your mind, you can think, okay, I know what that means. I became a Christian when I, or I became a Christian on this date, I became a Christian because, right? The same way you became a Christian is the same way you live after you become a Christian. Do you get that? In other words, becoming a Christian is not the beginning, or it's not the end of spiritual life. Becoming a Christian is the beginning of spiritual life. And, and the very same things that were true that caused you to become a Christian are the same things that are true that allow you to live out the Christian life. Let, let, me, let, me, let me, at, at risk of, I want to just sure do, I want to be as practical as I can be because some of this, it, it, it's just so important. Lisa, Lisa and I, we've been married 41 years, and I mean, it is, if you, you ought to come up and look at her today, she does not look like she's even 41 years old, let alone having been married 41 years. She pointed out to me this week a flaw that I have. I know you're as shocked as I am. I mean, it just, I was, I couldn't even begin to process, right? And Obviously, the only reason that she was able to detect the flaw is she's lived with me for 41 years. Otherwise, it would have just never been known by anybody, right? And, and in her very gently pointing out the flaw, do you know that the typical person, when they get a flaw pointed out to them, you know what they, they're going to do? They're probably going to become defensive. Isn't that a natural reaction? Right? Or they're going to deny. Now here's my point. Here's the point I'm trying to make to you. You can handle even finding out that you're less than perfect if you are connected to the gospel in a way that it just doesn't make you a Christian, but you are living out gospel truth. You can handle anything that comes into your life. I, I'm I, I, I'm not try, I do not want to make this about me, please. I do, I do not. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I really want you to get this. Uh, five years ago, I found out I had cancer. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be, I'm not trying to say this to you to, to be both. I'm not. I'm, in fact, I, I will tell you what I'm boasting in. I'm boasting in this. 
I'm boasting in the, in, the, in the cross of Jesus Christ, in the gospel of Jesus, okay? And, I, and I've had numerous people, and I could name some of them to you, and I could, I could recount the experience. I had numerous people say to me, how, how did you get through that? You, it, you act like it never bothered you. Let me tell you how you get through it. If you have, if you resolve the ultimate issue in your life, your relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter what happens to you, right, in the, in the minors of your life, if the major issue of your life, the ultimate issue of your life is taken care of, you can handle anything else that happens in your life, right? So here's the point. You want to become fully alive in Jesus. You want to be more than just somebody that makes a profession of faith. You want to be somebody more than just became a Christian. If you really want to be spiritually alive in Jesus, then you have to walk in gospel truth, right? You don't just have to have this, hey, I was a Christian and I got baptized and became a member of the church and now I'm as dead as a doornail. I am alive in Jesus, I'm walking in gospel truth. There's four gospel truths. I'm gonna just point them out, try to explain them on a, at a high level, give you a chance to respond to them. Here's, a, here's the first gospel truth that, that you and I have to walk in if we are going to experience renewal or revival. First of all, the gospel is the basis for your standing with God. In other words, you have no basis for acceptance with God apart from the gospel. This is what we call the doctrine of justification. The doctrine of justification is you're no, no longer guilty because of your sin. Through Jesus' work on the cross, you have legal standing before God. He has taken your guilt and shame away. He paid your sin debt. So in the sense of, 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 of relationship to God, in, in the sense of standing before God, you are debt free. You, you have no sin obligation. You have no payment obligation to make towards God. He made the payment for you. Let me show you where this truth is in this passage of scripture. In verse 13, he says, in you being dead in your sins, so apart from Jesus, you're dead, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him. Quickened means made alive. He made you alive together with him by your union with Jesus, having forgiven you all your trespasses. That's what deals with your guilt and shame. Verse 15, and having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, or I'm sorry, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So, so literally it's this. Because you are a sinner, you are born a sinner, your sin obligates you to, to pay off your debt before God. And until your debt before God is paid, you are what the Bible refers to as dead in your trespasses and sins. If you try to enter into the presence of God apart from the righteousness of Jesus, you are dead to God. You have, you have no basis, no legal standing before God at all. But Jesus came and he paid your debt. He took all the ordinances that were written against you. He took all the sin bills that were delivered to you, and he fulfilled those, and he paid for those on the cross, and you and I contribute not one single solitary thing to our standing before God. You have legal basis in standing before God, not by what you do, but because what Jesus did for you. Your assurance, listen very carefully, your assurance with God is not dependent upon what you did to be saved. It's not because you can take your Bible and you can show me you circled this verse on this day and you were in this place, you're not saved because of that. You're not saved because of your sincerity. You are not saved because of the infrequency of your obedience or disobedience, right? You are saved 
because you can look at the cross and see what Jesus did for you and he gave his righteousness to you as a free gift and by God's grace you believed in what Jesus did for you. If, you, if that's true, if, you, if, that, if your standing before God is based on what Jesus did and not what you do, then, then you will not be riddled by insecurity. You don't worry about your standing before God. You're not, in fact, you, you will have a way to deal with all the insecurities in your life because you don't have to worry about your standing. You don't have to worry about your worth before God. You, ha- you don't have to work in order to justify yourself before God. You will not be spiritually arrogant or or pridefully superior because you don't have to get your righteousness by looking down at other people. It'll keep you from being rigidly inflexible. You won't have to cling to legalistic and pharisaical righteousness. You actually, because you are so firm on the gospel that Jesus has given you his righteousness as a free gift, You do not have to be rigid about every single little meaningless secondary detail in your life. You're free. Here's why churches and here's why Christians, individual Christians, here's why churches struggle, and this is why we struggle passing this on generationally, right? We 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 want to pull our sanctification into our justification. That there's something we do by way of performance that gives us standing before God. <clears throat> My, uh, just, just try to get you to understand this. I was with my granddaughter yesterday. That can be one of my granddaughters of two the oldest of the two. It can be very expensive being with her. <laughs> she, don't say this out loud. Do not repeat. All right, everybody hold your right hand up. <laughs> I promise not to tell Christy I'm saying this. Okay. All right. She's not as expensive as her mother. <laughs> Blair Alice is not as expensive as, as Christy is. And we, I was with her, and Christy went to buy something. We were just at a simple place. And Blair said, well, I want. And she started pointing out things that she wanted. And Christy said, I don't have any money for that. You know what Blair Alice said? Papa does. <laughs> you know what she's saying? I don't have to pay for it. Right? If this ever breaks into your life, you don't have to pay for your sin. God dumped all of the riches of Jesus, all the resources of Jesus, all the righteousness of Jesus. He laid it out, and by the way, here's what Romans says, and and where sin abounds, you know what? Grace much more abounds. The grace of God overwhelms the horribleness of your sin so your debt is paid, your guilt is gone, and you're forgiven and free in Jesus Christ. Spiritual renewal will not occur if you rely on your sanctification for your justification. You must allow your justification to serve as the basis of your sanctification. What makes you alive in Jesus, what lets you walk in gospel truth, and when you see that you're standing, the gospel is is the basis for your standing before God. Here's the second truth, real quick. The gospel is the basis for your freedom from sin. <clears throat> now, we're going to back up to verse 11 here, and I just want to show you this little truth. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Every single one of you have, have a, a view that... that that determines how you think about sin. And, and you're like, and, and there's a continuum. By the way, there's no, in, in doing this, I'm, I'm preaching to a lot of people over, over multiple services 
if I was having an individual conversation with you, it, it would probably be a little bit more nuanced than what I'm about to make it. I realize that, that not everybody's at an extreme position, but typically here, here is the two extreme positions that we take about sin, right? One, we're, we're just absolutely overwhelmed and devastated and frustrated at the power that sin has over us. And, and for some of you, you have patterns of behavior in your life, destructive patterns of behavior, where sin is reigning in your life. It, your, sin has power over you. You're, in, you're incapable of, of living the way that you know God wants you to live because sin has a, a hold on you. The other extreme is this. You just keep minimizing sin. You just keep excusing it. You just keep justifying it. You just keep, well, it's not that big a deal. That's not, you know, well, okay, I do that, but that's not really sin because that sin is not nearly as bad as that sin. And I don't do the bad sins, I only do the good sins. <laughs> don't we do that? Right? Isn't that, isn't that human nature? And, and so what we fail to recognize is that all of us are, are living, if you will, we're, we're experiencing what is true about us, we're living out of the unredeemed tendencies of the human heart. And the unredeemed tendencies of the human heart is, is simply the lust of the flesh, of the body of the sin, it is that you're controlled by the things that you believe have to be true in your life in order for you to get standing before God, in order for you to be accepted by God. And you're controlled by those, those inclinations and those desires. And the truth of the matter is, most of you, most of us, all of us, we, we were, were discouraged by and, and were devastated by the fact that sin keeps winning, right? And that we're not living the life we know we should live. Well, the gospel says this, that when you receive Jesus, when you receive him, it's not only the beginning of life for you, but you are infused with a spiritual power that is going to give you the ability, the power to become free from sin. Say, how does that happen? Because when you become a Christian, it's not just a one-off, right? We wanna think, oh, I became a Christian, my name is written in the book of life and that guarantees me that I'm gonna go to heaven when we die. No, what that actually means is that the moment that you believed on Jesus, not only were you justified, God wrote your name down and you're, secu you're standing in secure before God, but God does the regenerative work in your life, the paleogenesis, the recreation in your life, and he makes you a brand new creature in Jesus Christ, and he literally puts the nature of God, he, he rewires the inner structure of your human heart, the fallen nature is be, being transfused by the new man, by the divine nature, and you're becoming a new person in Jesus Christ because of regeneration, which means now that it moves you towards an attitude of repentance where your mind is continually being renewed and you are shoring up, you're breaking up every area of conformity to the world's patterns of fleshliness and instead of being controlled by your fleshly desires, and by the way, some of you think only fleshly desires are, you know, I don't wanna murder, I don't wanna steal, I don't wanna kill, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do immoral things, I don't wanna have immoral thoughts, I don't wanna commit sexual sins. Fleshly patterns of behavior are, I don't wanna attract attention to me, I don't wanna boast, I don't wanna be superior to other people, I don't wanna be arrogant, I don't wanna be resisting to what God's doing in my life, I wanna become a, a humble version of what Jesus Christ both made me to be at creation and redeemed me to be at salvation. I become an expression of that. Which means you become radically dependent upon God's grace. You trust in God's grace to the degree that you have a comparable distrust towards your own stamina and faithfulness. In other words, you don't get free from sin 
because you are moral, because you are righteous, you get free from the power of sin because of the grace of God, right? And you break the pattern of sinful flesh. And Richard Lovelace said, a church with a, church with a weak understanding of sin will inevitably be a church in which the flesh is alive and spiritual vitality is dampened. So if you're walking in gospel truth, one, you, you have this deep, settled rest that comes in your heart. I'm accepted by God, not based on what I do, but what Jesus did. I don't have to be controlled by sin. God frees me through the gospel from the power of sin. Thirdly, here's the third truth, right? The gospel is the basis for the fullness of the Spirit. Now, I'm gonna do this quick. So, go, Colossians 2, for in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, for in, in Jesus dwells everything that is essential to the Godhead, to what it means to be God. Verse nine, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So in him, you are resourced with all the riches of the grace of God. In, in theological terms, you're justified, sanctified, and simultaneously you're filled with the Spirit of God, right? That, that's what happened, which means this. You, you gotta put this in your, in your notes, in your outline. You are not alone. Your spiritual life is not dependent upon you. Your spiritual life is actually predicated on the fact that you are complete in him and you have all the fullness of God dwelling inside of you. True spirituality is not superhuman religiosity, it is simply true humanity released from the bondage of sin and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, that is the fullness of God, is going to show you the potential you have for the likeness of Jesus. C.S. Lewis, and I don't have time to get off on this, but C.S. Lewis wrote about this extensively. He called it your future glory self, right? It's, it's what you are becoming in the future, and you are becoming that because the Spirit of God is inside of you, and he's taking the truths of the gospel, and he's, and he's pressing them into your life, into the reality of the inner structure of your human heart that allows you to stem the tide of decay and corruption that takes place in fallen human nature. You bring heaven to earth in your relationships and in your community, helping people to see the life that God has for them. John Newton, who wrote the words, the famous hymn, um, Amazing Grace, <clears throat> and that is an accurate reflection of his own testimony. He said, I am not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world but still I am not what I once used to be, and by the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, what was Newton driving at? Newton is, is actually saying this. It's the work of the Spirit of God inside of me that's making me reach my full potential, my redeemed potential in Jesus Christ because of the gospel. All right, if, if John Newton doesn't do it for you, how about Clark Kent? Do you know Clark Kent, right? Can you, can you picture with me little Clark? And he goes to his mom and dad one day and he, he, he says to them, how come I'm not like other kids? Other kids can't, right, leap tall buildings in a single bound. Other kids don't have x-ray vision. And they say to him, you're different. You have these special powers, and these special powers can only be used or, or can be used to accomplish incredible good. Let me tell you something. The redeemed version of you, because of the justification of God and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God, the fullness of God in your life, you are little Clark Kent's. Do you get that? You are filled with the Spirit of God and God is gonna send you into this world to bring heaven to earth and change the world around you because now he has dumped into your life through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit the fullness of all that God is, all that God has in. The reality of that is inside of you. 
Can you just, can you just for a moment get a glimpse of what your life would look like, what your influence would look like in other people, what this church would look like if we all just lived as little Clark Kents filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Can you imagine what that, what that would create as an appetite in your children, in your grandchildren, in your family? Do, do you see that? Last thing, very quick. The gospel is the basis for spiritual power against evil. There's actually, and we're gonna touch on these, kind of unpack them a little deeper over the next couple of weeks, but the, the, here, here's, here's, here's the flow. Here's the elements of revival, right? You're accepted by God because of Jesus. You have the power to become free from sin because of Jesus. You have access to the fullness of God through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit which means you do not have to fear anything at all in the world. You can push back against the darkness. Look at, the, look at verse 15, the last verse. Look what he says. And having spoiled principalities, 1 John 3, verse eight, the, the, the work of Jesus on the cross destroyed the works of the devil. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jonathan Edwards says in, in uh, History of Redemption, God's kingdom is an ever-expanding circle of light in the world's darkness. It draws inward at times a spiritual decline, and it pulses outward in an increasing circumference when it is accomp and accompanied by a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, we're, we're actually doing this. I mean, I, and I'm not saying this both, but we have, we have two schools. We have a, a college and academy. And, and we're, we see this in the academy and we see it in the college as we, as we, as we shape students' lives, individual children's lives and, and their families by the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And, and they, they begin to push against the darkness, right? We begin to see real spiritual victory. We, we do this at our rescue mission. We're pushing back against, not, now just think about this, not, not just against homelessness, but we're pushing back against poverty and, and, and addiction. We're pushing back against the disintegration that occurs in the lives of the most vulnerable and marginalized people in the city of Jacksonville. We're doing that in, in church campuses. We're doing that in, in, in the Mandarin community. We're doing that in the Oak Leaf community. We're doing it here as we've been doing it for, for 50 plus years. On this campus, we're pushing back with the gospel. We don't do this because we're superhuman people. We're not doing this because we, we are our gifted organization. We're not doing this because we have human resources. We're doing this because Jesus went to the cross and on the cross, he, he so defeated sin and evil and the devil that out of the victory that Jesus gave to us on the cross, we can go into the world and push back against the darkness. If the beauty of the gospel, if the beauty of Jesus ever breaks through in your life, it'll, it'll radically change you. Do you remember, have you ever been to Sunday school? Have you ever heard the story of David and Goliath? How many of you know the story of David and Goliath? If a preacher ever gets up and tells you about David and Goliath and they say, well, this is a great story about how you defeat the little, how you defeat the giants in your life, just close your Bible or just make a little note. They don't know what they're talking about. That is not the story of David and Goliath. The story of David and Goliath is this. Israel was terrified of the Philistines. And the Philistines had this, this champion, Goliath. He was 10 feet, 6 inches tall. And he kept coming out and he kept saying, he kept, the Bible uses this expression, he, he was bringing a reproach against the God of Israel. And he said, send, send out an enemy to fight, send out a, a, a man to fight against me. And, and nobody would fight. The children of Israel were scared to fight. They, they were locked literally in their camp. They would not go fight against this evil giant, right? And then <clears throat> David shows up. And David says, hey, we can't let him say bad things about our God. God's honor is at stake. And so David took a sling and five stones 
and he put a, a stone in the sling and he went out into the valley against the giant of the Philistines and he took the sling and he put the, the stone in the sling and he slung it around and he, and he threw the stone and it went into the head of the giant and he fell over. And then David ran down and took Goliath's own sword and he cut off Goliath's head. And when the children of Israel that had been terrified to even come out of their tents and they feared for their life and they wouldn't do anything about the Philistines when they saw David standing down there in the valley holding the head of the giant, you know what they did? They came out of their tents and they came running down the mountain and the Philistines saw it and the Philistines started running the other direction and the children of Israel were chasing the Philistines and they drove them back to where they came from. Say, what's the lesson? It's not how you get over the little giants in your life. Here's the lesson. Here's the whole point of the story. David is pointing to a true and better David. It's pointing to the fact that one day Jesus was going to come, and he was going to go to the cross, and he was going to slay the giant. He was going to slay the devil for us on the cross. And his victory becomes our victory. Even though we did not lift a stone to do one thing, we live out of that victory. And that becomes true. And the beauty of that becomes real in your life. It will make your heart come alive. It will make you believe this is not true. It's also real. Jonathan Edwards in The Great Awakening famously, you've heard me say this on dozens of occasions. He said, there's two ways for a man to know that honey is sweet. You can either describe it to him in a way that he begins to believe what you're saying. He believes the description and he says that has to be true because of the way you say it and what you say about it, that honey is sweet. There's another way to get man to know that honey is sweet, and that is you give him a taste. And when you put honey in your mouth and you experience it, here's what spiritual renewal and spiritual revival is. When that which you know to be true becomes real. Do you know what your kids need for you to do? Is to have the truth of the gospel move from your head into your heart, to explode into your life, so that it becomes real. If you're constantly worried, if you, if you just, if you agonize over your acceptance with God, if you wonder, where do I get my standing for God? It's because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you're tormented by sin in your life and you cannot get victory over it, the answer is Jesus and Jesus worked for you on the cross. If you feel like you are all alone and you wonder, how am I gonna make it through life? You're not living out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God coming into your life. And if you fear, if you, if you are tormented and fearful about what's happening in the world around you, if you're intimidated, if you're constantly worried, then here, here, here's what you haven't seen, that the giant's head has been knocked off He's dead. And Jesus has made a show of him openly. He's triumphed over him so that you can live out of his victory on the cross for you. Stand with me for prayer, if you would. <clears throat> Today, if, if that doesn't, if that's not your experience, if you say, hey, I know that's true, but I don't live out of that, here's the starting point. Come today and say, God, I want you to make the gospel to become real to me. It can be true and not be real. Today, we want it to be both true and real. If you can't get over this, this idea, I don't know if I did enough in order to become a Christian. You can never do enough to become a Christian. You're not a Christian because of what you do. It's not a first-person issue. It's a third-person issue. You're a Christian not because of what you did. You're a Christian because of what Jesus did for you. If 
If you're struggling with sin or if you minimize sin in your life today, today you can come and say, I want the power of Jesus. I want to apply the gospel truth to my life so I can live free from sin. I want to have the presence of the Holy Spirit and not live my life alone, but I want to live out of the victory of Jesus. Father, speak to us today. May the gospel explode the reality of it in our lives in a way that changes us in Jesus' name.